thank you to my patrons. Your generosity and commitment to my work is astonishing. I sincerely appreciate it. If you'd like to see your name in the credits and gain access to a plethora of other perks, bonuses, and extras, please consider becoming a patron today. Simply click the link in the description below. Thank you. Does Sam Harris want to execute a nuclear first strike on the Arab world? Is it clear that he is aggressively pursuing this course of action and that he wants to launch the nukes in the morning? Because that's the impression I get from his critics when they talk about this. I believe he's dangerous. They talk about Harris as though he is actively pursuing this policy prescription. Sam Harris, in the end of faith, asks us to consider a nuclear first strike on the Arab world. They talk about him as though if he were handed the nuclear launch codes in the morning, that he would push the red button. Well, Im imagine having Sam Harris as president of the United States with access to the nuclear launch codes. But that's not what Harris said. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Thank you. Hey everybody, Magic Skeptic here, and you're all very welcome to another episode of A Magician's Thoughts. Up for today, guys, is a topic that I've been wanting to address for a very long time. And speaking of long times, those of you who are long-term viewers of my content will no doubt have heard the name Sam Harris. I don't think it's any secret that Harris has had an influence on my thinking particularly when I was a younger man and when I was deconverting from Catholicism. I think it's fair to say that Harris helps me to see the light. So yes, Harris has had an influence on my thinking, but that doesn't mean that I agree with him on everything. In fact, I've made videos on this channel in the past which explain my disagreements with Sam Harris. But those disagreements are purely academic. The same cannot be said for the critique that is the subject matter of this video. The question is, does Sam Harris want to execute a nuclear first strike on the Arab world? Because that is what his critics allege. Now, you may be wondering, why the hell am I covering this 20-year-old allegation now? And the answer is simple. My reason for covering this allegation is that it serves as an exquisite example and case study of political bias and the complete and utter failure of skepticism. So, if for no other reason, covering this allegation will help to refine mine, and by extension, your sceptical toolkit. But I digress. Before we go any further with this video, just so that we know where, we're, where we are, just so that we know what we're dealing with, have a listen to the following compilation of clips, just so you can get a flavor of this critique that has been leveled at Harris. Take a look. Let's talk about um, one thing that is on everybody's mind when it comes to the issue of Sam Harris, uh, this issue of the nuclear first strike. This is the issue that Sam and his uh, supporters point to most often for he is so misrepresented. By the way, quick sidebar here on has there ever been a critic of Sam Harris who has not been accused of misrepresenting him? That's a literal question. I'm not sure there is. Why? Because Sam Harris, as you'll see in this same segment, says two things at the same time. It's terrible, but we should do it, or maybe we should do it. It's terrible. I said it's terrible. You're misrepresenting me. Sam Harris, in the end of faith, asks us to consider a nuclear first strike on the Arab world. They defend torture. I mean, this kind of stuff is uh, terrifying. Yeah, but that's not the worldview of atheists. That's the worldview no. of Sam Harris. No, it's the new atheist. There's been a lot of uh, coverage on the blogosphere and so forth about uh, Affleck's comment, him being, you know, being gross and racist and comments. My concerns go deeper than that. I, uh, I believe he's dangerous. I believe it's as dangerous as, well, Im imagine having Sam Harris as president of the United States with access to the nuclear launch codes. That is no different to the fear of having Sarah Palin in charge of the nuclear lo launch codes. Wow. Bill, this is a guy that has a binary worldview, us versus them, mm -hmm. good versus bad, has already said that uh, would support possibly a nuclear first strike on the Arab world, has already said that it's justifiable in some instances that you may kill people for just having bad ideas. Now, think about that for a moment. Where has that happened before in the past in history? Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. You know, Mao Zedong, when he invaded Tibet, said to the Dalai Lama there, religion poisons everything and we're going to kill all the religious people. Uh, the Bill, Ma Bill Maher and his acolytes 
are as uh, historically and culturally and, histo uh, and uh, geopolitically ignorant as any Christian fundamentalist that you will ever meet. So there you have it, folks. You heard it from the horse's mouth. These three thinkers, and I use that word liberally, have laid out the accusation. Sam Harris wants to execute a nuclear first strike on the Arab world. Sam Harris, in the end of faith, asks us to consider a nuclear first strike on the Arab world. And because of this, we shouldn't take him seriously. In fact, we should be very, very worried. One thing that is on everybody's mind when it comes to the issue of Sam Harris, uh, this issue of the nuclear first strike. Sam Harris is dangerous, a dangerous thinker. I believe he's dangerous. Who we should dread if he ever gets into the Oval Office and gets access to the nuclear launch codes. Well, Im imagine having Sam Harris as President of the United States with access to the nuclear launch codes. We hear the message loud and clear. Is there any substance to these allegations? Well, guys, these allegations originate with Sam Harris's very first book, The End of of faith. So the question is, what exactly did Sam say in his book that has led these thinkers to the conclusion that he's a genocidal maniac? Well, who better to clarify that than Sam Harris himself? What we're going to do here, guys, is dive into the text itself. We're going to read a very short segment, the segment which is the root of these allegations. Let's read through it and see if these allegations hold any water. And I quote, it should be of particular concern to us that the beliefs of Muslims pose a special problem for nuclear deterrence. There is little possibility of our having a cold war with an Islamist regime armed with long-range nuclear weapons. A cold war requires that the parties be mutually deterred by the threat of death. Notions of martyrdom and jihad run roughshod over the logic that allowed the United States and the Soviet Union to pass half a century perched more or less stably on the brink of Armageddon. What will he do if an Islamist regime, which grows dewy-eyed at the mere mention of paradise, ever acquires long-range nuclear weaponry? If history is any guide, we will not be sure about where the offending warheads are or what their state of readiness is, and so we will be unable to rely on targeted conventional weapons to destroy them. In such a situation, the only thing likely to ensure our survival may be a nuclear first strike of our own. Needless to say, this would be an unthinkable crime, as it would kill tens of millions of innocent civilians in a single day. But it may be the only course of action available to us, given what Islamists believe. How would such an unconscionable act of self-defense be perceived by the rest of the Muslim world? It would likely be seen as the first incursion of a genocidal crusade. The horrible irony here is that seeing could make it so. This very perception could plunge us into a state of hot war with any Muslim state that had the capacity to pose a nuclear threat of its own. All of this is perfectly insane, of course. I've just described a plausible scenario in which much of the world's population could be annihilated on account of religious ideas that belong on the same shelf with Batman, the Philosopher's Stone, and unicorns. That it would be a horrible absurdity for so many of us to die for the sake of myth does not mean, however, that it could not happen. Indeed, given the immunity to all reasonable intrusions that faith enjoys in our discourse, a catastrophe of this sort seems increasingly likely. We must come to terms with the possibility that men, who are every bit as zealous to die as the 19 hijackers, may one day get their hands on long-range nuclear weaponry. The Muslim world in particular must anticipate this possibility and find some way to prevent it. Given the steady proliferation of technology, it is safe to say that time is not on our side. So, what do you think, dear listener? Does Sam Harris want to execute a nuclear first strike on the Arab world? Is it clear that he is aggressively pursuing this course of action and that he wants to launch the nukes in the morning? Because that's the impression I get from his critics when they talk about this. I believe he's dangerous. They talk about Harris as though he is actively pursuing this policy prescription. Sam Harris, in the end of faith, asks us to consider a nuclear first strike on the Arab world. They talk about him as though if he were handed the nuclear launch codes in the morning, that he would push the red button. Well, um, imagine having Sam Harris as president of the United States with access to the nuclear launch codes. But that's not what Harris said. You want to do a nuclear first strike on the Muslim world. Right. right. Is that true, Sam? No, no, alas, it's not true. Okay. 
Harris in this passage is very obviously talking about a specific scenario. It's almost like a trolley problem. There are a couple of passages in the end, my first book, The End of Faith, where I talk about how a certainty about paradise and about martyrdom as the best way to get there mm -hmm. just destroys the logic of r nuclear deterrence, of, of mutually assured destruction. All I was talking about is how the kind of game theoretic logic mm -hmm. of nuclear deterrence that we lived, however precariously under, with the Soviet Union falls apart once you admit to yourself that it's possible that truly suicidal religious maniacs can get their hands on these weapons. And so all I was calling for is, is um, our awareness that that, is a, that really is a game changer and we have to avoid that at all costs. He's talking about a very precarious situation where we might have to act first out of self-preservation. This isn't difficult to understand. Sam Harris isn't recommending as a general policy prescription that we should drop nukes on Arabs. He's not recommending as a general policy prescription that we should nuke out of existence Muslim-majority countries. He's not even suggesting that we should nuke specific regimes that currently exist out of existence. So you have Pakistan. Pakistan already has nuclear weapons. Do I think we should execute a nuclear first strike on Pakistan? No. Pakistan is not, first of all, a jihadist regime. And uh, though, you know, they're one coup away from being uh, right, right. taken over by one. But they're also, they don't have uh, the warheads that can deliver these nukes to the, the capitals of Europe or to the U.S. Um, it's a very different circumstance. Nowhere does he recommend as a general policy prescription that we ought execute a nuclear first strike on Muslim-majority countries. And yet, if you listen to his critics, that's exactly what they imply. Sam Harris, in the end of faith, asks us to consider a nuclear first strike on the Arab world. I believe he's dangerous. They leave out all of the specifics. They leave out all of the context and the detail which illuminates the reader in terms of Sam Harris's goal, in terms of his intent, in terms of what he was attempting to convey. I don't want 10 million innocent civilians killed in America. I don't want them killed in Tel Aviv, and I don't want them killed in the middle of the Middle East. It doesn't make it any better that there are 10 million innocent Muslim civilians. Unless, of course, you think they're all kind of Islamist anyway. What difference does it make? Sam Harris is clearly talking about a specific scenario. He is not even for a second recommending a general policy prescription about how we all treat the Muslim world or the Arab world more generally. Despite this, Harris's critics continue to insist that Harris is, in fact, a bloodthirsty anti-Islamic bigot. For example, Sam, according to Jenk, apologizes for his genocidal bigotry by calling it a hypothetical. Oh, I'm just engaging in a thought experiment, says Jenk, trying to malign Sam Harris and make it look like that he's simply trying to provide cover for his bigoted point of view. Now, this is uh, one of his famous thought experiments. I'm just saying. But this is what moral philosophers do. All I was talking about is how the kind of game theoretic logic mm -hmm. of nuclear deterrence that we lived, however precariously under with the Soviet Union, falls apart once you admit to yourself that it's possible that truly suicidal religious maniacs can get their hands on these weapons. Moral philosophers engage in moral hypotheticals all the time, and those moral hypotheticals often involve unthinkable scenarios. For example, trolley problems are very popular in moral philosophy, guys. They usually take the form of a number of people are tied down to a track, there's a trolley coming down the line that's gonna roll over these people and kill them. But luckily, you're standing there and there's a lever that you can pull in order to divert the trolley or the train. Unfortunately, though, if you pull the lever and divert the train, it will kill a single person who's tied down on the alternative track. Needless to say, this is a terrible situation. And while the utilitarians among you will no doubt point out that the answer is simple, that is, we must pull the lever because doing so saves three lives at the expense of one, the reality is much more complicated than that. Do you really want to be personally responsible for the death of that single individual on the alternative track? Because you would be responsible by pulling the lever. I can complicate this even further by changing the scenario and making it such that the person on the alternative track is your closest loved one. 
Suddenly, your utilitarian instincts go out the window. Is it still obvious that you should pull the lever? You're still saving three lives at the expense of one, but if that one life is somebody that you hold dear, suddenly, pulling the lever isn't so obvious anymore. And that's just one variation of the trolley problem. The other variation involves a fat man standing on a bridge above the track, and the question is, should you push the fat man? Exact same moral principle is involved. When you push the fat man onto the track, it stops the trolley proceeding, and then you save the lives of three. But the point is, guys, moral philosophers engage in these kinds of moral hypotheticals all the time. That's why I've shared the trolley problem with you. Moral philosophers do this literally all the time. Jenks equivalent, if they were to listen to Sam talking about the trolley problem, would say, oh, Sam is just masquerading his bigotry in the form of a moral hypothetical. Now, this is a, one of his famous thought experiments. I'm just saying. Sam just really wants to kill fat people. He just really wants to push fat men off of bridges. Sam Harris, in the end of faith, asks us to consider a nuclear first strike on the Arab world. He's murderous and bigoted, and he just wants to wipe out people who are overweight. I believe he's dangerous. How dare he hide his obvious bigotry in this moral dilemma? How dare he present his bigotry and try to hide it in the form of a moral question or in the form of a thought experiment? That's exactly what Sam Harris's critics are doing here. One thing that's happening to me now in conversations like this and in, you know, on many topics is that much of, much of my discussions have not to do with policy, but are, have been an effort to get at ethical bedrock. I mean, I write and think as a philosopher. Mm -hmm. And in, in, a, in, in the context of having a philosophical discussion about ethics and right and wrong, you can say many things that seem crazy outside of a, right. a philosophy seminar, but in a philosophy seminar are totally legitimate. So in a philosophy seminar, you could say, you know, why can't we eat babies? What's wrong with eating babies? If we've right. got extra babies around that nobody wants, why can't we eat them, right? That is a completely insane thing to say in the world, mm -hmm. s mm -hmm. seemingly. That's the kind of thing that if quoted out of context, you know, if, if Glenn Greenwald decides to tweet, you know, Sam Harris can't, can't figure out why we can't eat babies, right? It makes me look like an asshole. But the reality is, is that if you're talking about, if you're trying to get to the bedrock about the the the, the ethics of, of of good and evil and the use of force, if you're trying to just then then starting the conversation with why can't we eat babies? You know, what, what, give me an ethical argument about why this is really really wrong. Why our intuitions of its wrongness is is, is can be conserved. That is a totally legitimate thing to do, and there's not a philosopher on earth who would think you were a weirdo for having that conversation. It's okay for moral philosophers to engage in thought experiments. It's just that this thought experiment is very uncomfortable. But that's the whole point of moral philosophy. We're supposed to confront uncomfortable moral situations and think them through. Confronting these moral hypotheticals tests our meta-ethical assumptions. Confronting these situations tests our moral framework. And that's exactly what Harris is doing in this thought experiment. All I was talking about is how the kind of game theoretic logic mm -hmm. of nuclear deterrence that we lived, however precariously under, with the Soviet Union falls apart once you admit to yourself that it's possible that truly suicidal religious maniacs can get their hands on these weapons. He is not masquerading his bigotry, and if you're going to say that that is the case, you are engaged in mind reading. But that is exactly what the Young Turks do all of the time. You're doing some mind reading. When Cenk says that Sam is merely using this moral hypothetical as cover, this thought experiment as cover for his bigotry. Now, this is a, one of his famous thought experiments. I'm just saying. You are simply engaging in mind reading, and I do not buy it. So before I bring this to a close, I want to anticipate two potential criticisms of the argument that I've laid out in this video. The first criticism that I anticipate is that people will say, but Magic Skeptic, if you read Harris's book, he is just talking about Muslims. He's not just talking about extremists. He's not just talking about Islamists. And even in this very hypothetical, Harris is talking about Muslims. It should be of particular concern to us that the beliefs of Muslims pose a special problem for nuclear deterrence. There is little possibility of our having a cold war with an Islamist regime armed with long-range nuclear weapons. So I must admit, Sam Harris slips up here in this very first sentence when he dives into this thought experiment. The mistake he makes is that he deploys the word Muslims in the very first sentence. And 
To be fair to his critics, to be fair to those that I've already cited in this video, if you're going to use the word Muslims, then that does seem like you're making a general comment about the Muslim world, as opposed to focusing on the extremists. Thankfully, Harris clarifies in the very next sentence when he refers to the people he's actually talking about as Islamists. So it's very clear, if you're being fair, if you're being charitable, if you don't have an agenda and you're honest goal is to simply understand what the man is saying. It's very clear that Harris is talking about Islamists who are an extreme sect of the Islamic faith. All Islamists are Muslim, but not all Muslims are Islamists. That might be a useful way of thinking about it. So when you take that into consideration, it's obvious that Sam Harris is not talking about all Muslims. He's talking about a particular cohort of Muslims. And if that's not clear, again, listen to the following, and I quote, We must come to terms with the possibility that men, who are every bit as zealous to die as the 19 hijackers, may one day get their hands on long-range nuclear weaponry. The Muslim world in particular must anticipate this possibility and find some way to prevent it. Sam Harris is distinguishing between Muslims like the 19 hijackers on one hand and the Muslim world on the other. That is the ideology that you see in a happily a, a small minority of Muslims at this moment. So guys, it's very clear if you read this chapter, again, unless you have an agenda or unless your goal is to vilify, if you're keeping your biases out of it, if you're keeping your agenda at the door, it's very obvious here that Sam Harris is talking about extremists. The second criticism I want to anticipate here is a criticism that Jenk outlines in his very own video. So I'm going to play that critique for you right now, and then I'll respond to it and make some final comments. So now let's take the same thought experiment and just do one simple change, change the location and see if it's still a maybe. An ISIS guy is infiltrated, we got a sleeper cell, they're in Tallahassee, but we can't tell where in Tallahassee, and they might launch against Washington. Do we nuke Florida and kill tens of millions of innocent civilians that are American civilians? Would anyone think that that was reasonable? And within the range of consideration. Of course not, those are American civilians, they count, they matter. Now, let's say an ISIS guy gets a warhead, but god damn it, he's in a sleeper cell in Tel Aviv. Ah, thought exercise, what if we kill 10 million Jews to make sure we get that guy? Because he must la might launch against Seattle or San Antonio or Washington or other parts of Israel. This is a terrible thing to bring up as a maybe. I don't want 10 million innocent civilians killed in America. I don't want them killed in Tel Aviv, and I don't want them killed in the middle of the Middle East. It doesn't make it any better that there are 10 million innocent Muslim civilians. Unless, of course, you think they're all kind of Islamist anyway. What difference does it make? Now, he didn't say that. He said unthinkable crime, but maybe, maybe. No, not maybe, not maybe. <laughs> the fact that you could countenance that and then pose it as kind of more of like a fantasy than a thought experiment, like, hmm. Right. And here we have it once again, dear listener, the criticism that I raised of the Young Turks and Cenk Iger more specifically earlier in the video, mind reading. Cenk comes right out and says it. He explicitly says that Sam Harris's answer in this moral hypothetical would change if the lives that were at stake were non-Muslim, if the lives that were at stake were Jewish, or if the lives that were at stake were American. An ISIS guy is infiltrated, we got a sleeper cell, they're in Tallahassee, but we can't tell where in Tallahassee, and they might launch against Washington. Do we nuke Florida and kill tens of millions of innocent civilians that are American civilians? Would anyone think that that was reasonable? And within the range of consideration, of course not, those are American civilians, they count, they matter. Now. I don't know what Sam Harris would say. This question has never been put to him, but that doesn't matter because we've got mind reader and psychic extraordinaire Jenk to answer on Harris's behalf. And the mind reading doesn't stop there. Did you catch it, dear listener? Towards the end, Jenk comes right out and says it. This isn't just a thought experiment. This 
is a fantasy of Harris's. The fact that you could countenance that and then pose it as kind of more of like a fantasy than a thought experiment, like, hmm, right? In other words, and I think the implication is clear, Harris is engaged in some kind of pleasure-driven, megalomaniacal, bloodthirsty fantasy. What a preposterous allegation. But I'm not surprised. Leave it to the Young Turks to assume that their interlocutor is racist or bigoted or hateful. That is their currency. That is their entire business model. But again, I'm not surprised because that's what Cenk does. That's his whole shtick. He says stuff in a silly voice. He is quite literally the Bill O'Reilly of the left. Tide goes in, tide goes out. Never miscommunication. You can't explain that. The misrepresentations and the slanderous approach and the just mind reading that goes on on a daily basis on the Young Turks is just appalling. And their treatment of Sam Harris is yet another example of that behavior. In just a very kind of game theoretic way, I asked us to consider how a, a belief in martyrdom, a belief in paradise, just unties this, this convention of mutually assured destruction as a deterrence. This, the Cold War was possible because both, not, neither side wanted to play, really play a game of chicken. When you're playing a game of chicken with someone who wants to get to paradise, you're screwed. You're going to lose this game of chicken, right? So, um, and the moment you accept, and again, many people don't accept this for reasons I cannot fathom, but the moment you accept that certain people really do believe in paradise, really do want to die and to get there, right? They're just, they're hoping to be martyred. This is that death today would not be a bad thing for them. And then you just, you imagine us failing to keep the big bombs and the long range missiles out of their hands. You imagine a regime that is just like ISIS, but they've got ICBMs. We have to find some way to avoid that. And, and the Muslim world in particular has to find some way to avoid that.